All right, I just got the I just got the cue to get started. Can they hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, now you can hear me. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm super excited to um, introduce our speaker today. I think most of you know her, um, Dr. Michelle Niemer. Um, she was uh, born and raised in Ann Arbor, right? Um, and uh, is really dedicated to primary care of traditionally uh, underserved patients with a particular interest in Latino populations. She graduated from Yale University with a degree in biology and then attended Wash U uh, University uh, Medical School in St. Louis and then completed her residency in internal medicine primary care at Brigham and Women's Hospital where she stayed to serve as chief resident and instructor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She currently sees uh, primary care patients at McCafferty Health Center and does some inpatient work, I think, with all of you on the teaching service and does uh, work in community health, um, doing diabetes education for Latinos, most of which she developed for us, and is the co-program director of primary care for vulnerable populations track, which we will be both starting to interview for this uh, season. And in her spare time, she loves spending time with her family, Michigan football, um, yoga and cooking. Um, but of course, that begs two questions. Um, what do you like to cook? Um, any food, mostly Mexican. Okay, cool. <laughs> and um, what kind of crazy inversion poses do you do in yoga? I do no inversion. <laughs> I cannot invert. Dog inversion. Oh, well, there you go. Okay, I do do downward dog. But I'm too tall for any handstands. There you go. <laughs> Thank so, you, Catherine. Um, she's going to be talking about what providers should know about prescription drug costs. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much for being here. Can you guys all hear me okay with this mic? Okay, if it gets bad, please let me know. Um, so I am really excited to talk to you guys about this topic of what providers should know about prescription drug costs. Um, I wanna start by saying I have no financial disclosures. And I just wanna let you know the objectives of our talk today, which is basically to identify and understand the entities involved in setting drug prices, getting prices, um, drugs approved and then to market. Um, understand the policies that govern it, because this is a place where policies have a lot of effect, and then be able to identify avenues for future change um, down the road. So in order to do that, we're going to talk about, first just start with what is the scope of the problem? What is this issue that we're talking about today, prescription drug costs? Um, then we'll discuss kind of person or player by player, who are the players involved? And we'll, during that time, we'll touch on some of the big policies that um, govern those players. Um, and then we'll talk about what is the road ahead, uh, both politically on a state level and a federal level, and then what you can do with your patients in the office um, and how you can get involved as well in this issue. So let me start by talking about the problem. So when I talk about the problem, I'm going to touch on three ma major things. I'm going to touch on how it's an economic burden in our country, how it creates a burden for our patients, and then uh, kind of a perspective on um, how we feel about it here at Metro based on some of the survey results that you all participated in. Um, so to break it down for you, the financial burden is huge. So we spend a lot on prescription drugs in this country, and it is way more than in other countries. So to give you an idea, the best recent estimate that we have is from 2015, and the U.S. actually spent $457 billion that year on prescription drug costs close to 17% of the overall health services. Um, and they track kind of how this increases every year. The most recent one we had for that was between 2013 and, and 14, and it increased almost 20% during that time. So that's way more than the rate of inflation. That's a huge amount of um, increase. And then when you look at, um, you know, how we compare to other countries who have very good healthcare systems, we spend about twice as much as the average um, other country. So we spend close to $1,000, $858 per person versus other places they spend about $400 per person. And this is just a slide that shows that in orange is the OECD median. There we are all the way on the left um, in red, uh, definitely about twice as much as other places pay. Um, and there's been a lot of data now that shows that this is actually a huge burden on patients and affects compliance and adherence a lot. So um, in a recent poll, 77% of Americans said that the cost of prescription drugs are unreasonable, and Kaiser Family Foundation does a lot of great data on this, um, and they noted in one of their recent polls, looked at people from 2015 to 2018, 44% of the public is worried that they won't be able to afford their prescription drugs, so almost half of our patients, and 24% or a quarter say they or a family 
member has either not filled a prescription, skipped doses, or um, cut pills in half because of this issue. So when I ask you all, and thank you guys for doing the survey, um, about this statement, I hear from my patients that the cost of the medications I prescribe adversely affected their ability to take the medication as I prescribe it. So someone did not take their medication as I prescribed it because of the cost. 64% of us said we heard this at least once a week or more. Um, and kind of staying on us for a second, um, this is a really uh, big source of frustration for physicians. And what became clear to me through our survey is that there's a huge lack of transparency. So when I said, um, how, do you agree with the statement, I understand how prescription drugs are priced, 84% of us disagreed or somewhat disagreed, whereas only 16% agreed. And I consider you all very intelligent colleagues. So if you guys don't understand, no one's going to understand. Um, so similarly, it is easy for me to know how much a medication will cost a patient. So when I send something in, am I going to know what it's cost? 97% of us said they either disagreed or strongly disagreed with that statement. Only 2% agreed. And I'd like to talk to those 2% because they got to teach me something. Um, so that's basically the scope of the problem. And now I want to move, out, move down and kind of look at some of the big players. So I'm going to touch on the Food and Drug Administration, um, pharmaceutical companies, generic companies, pharmacy benefit managers, and then insurers, which sometimes are called payers. It's interchangeable. We'll talk about both our public insurers and our private insurers. And I'll go through all that. And whenever you see a key, that's going to highlight key policy. So um, keep your eye out for that. So this is a basic diagram of drug creation and approval. So over on your left side, you'll see that um, basically a pharmaceutical company develops a drug, and they do this through their own research and development process. They do it through government and NIH-funded research, and we'll talk about that. And then there's also a lot of private investment in the pharmaceutical industry. It's a huge industry. And kind of in that melange, that's how a drug gets made at a pharmaceutical company. And then it goes on and it goes to the FDA for approval, which we'll talk about. Then it gets returned to the pharmaceutical company, and then it gets distributed, and we'll talk about that. Um, there's also generic companies that interact with the FDA for approval for their generics, and they also have to interact with the pharmaceutical companies, and we'll talk about both those processes. So that's drug creation and approval. Now, drug distribution and pricing is even more complicated. So once your pharmaceutical company has a drug, they often are negotiating with pharmacy benefit managers. Those pharmacy benefit managers are negotiating with insurers and pharmacies. And then those, all, those patients go ahead and interact with their insurers, and they also interact with their pharmacies to get the drug. Make sense? That's it. That's the whole talk. We're good. Um, just kidding. We're going to go through every single one of these things and hopefully clarify the process. So let's break it down. So let's start with the pharmaceutical companies. So um, pharmaceutical companies are a very hot topic, um, and I tried really hard when I was researching this to be really unbiased and try to understand all my sources um, because there's a lot of kind of hot feelings on both sides. Um, so in terms of the good things about pharmaceutical companies, you know, they are a source of innovation and advancement in our economy and in medicine, and they're the highest performing sector in the U.S. economy. So they create jobs. They create a lot of um, money, for lack of a better term. Um, and they, you know, they do sort of move medicine along. They invest in that. Um, there's a couple caveats to the way that pharmaceutical companies work that I think are important to think about and realize. So when you think about how pharmaceutical companies set a price. Um, in most other developed countries, pharmaceuticals are regulated as a utility. So when they go to set a price, they go before a government commission with physicians and scientists, and they sort of collectively decide, okay, based on how much you spent on R&D, uh, based on how your drug performs compared to other medicines, we're going to set your new drug at this price. Um, that doesn't happen in the U.S. The pharmaceutical company just gets to set the price at whatever they think the market will bear. Um, so they kind of just get to decide that, and we can talk about that more. Um, there's also a lot of lack of transparency with pharmaceutical companies on how they set prices. So a lot of times they'll make the argument that they spend, um, you know, they drug prices really high because of their our research and development costs and how much it costs to make a medication. But in reality, there's been a lot of good data now that shows that 
pharmaceutical companies spend a lot more on marketing than they do on research and development, and they tend to really overestimate the investment in research and development that they make. Um, pharmaceutical companies also engage in a lot of anti-competitive practices, and I want to mention these because they come up later in policy opportunities. So one thing that pharmaceutical companies do is when their patent has ended, they sometimes directly pay generic companies not to make a generic of that medication. That's called pay for delay. It's legal, actually. Um, they also do something called evergreening or product hopping, and I'm sure you've all experienced this in your clinical practice where a patent runs out on a medication and they will change something very small about the medication, rebrand it, repatent it, and then sell it as a new drug. Um, and then often they'll discontinue the old drug so that there is no generic of that drug. I mean, that happens frequently. And then we'll talk about this as well, but in the generic approval process, you have to have samples from pharmaceutical companies to show bioequivalence between your generic medication and your pharmaceutical-generated medication. Um, and actually, many times they just refuse to give samples, which is also legal. So they're kind of obstructionist in that way. And then the last thing I want to mention about the pharmaceutical companies that I think is really important for us to know as voters is that they have an extremely powerful, in fact, maybe the most powerful lobby in Washington. So um, uh, in 2017, they spent $25.5 million just lobbying Congress people, and they have 1,274 registered lobbyists just for Congress, and that ends up being about two, sometimes more than two, um, lobbyists per member of Congress. So. Um, that's actually a really huge, and there's, there's one other number I wanted to give you. So we can talk more about issue two, which was on our ballot last November here in Ohio. Um, the pharmaceutical lobby called Pharma, or Pharmaceutical Research Manufacturers of America, that PHRMA, um, they spent six, close to $60 million, $58 million here in the state of Ohio campaigning against issue two. So they have a lot of money in, and a lot of skin in the game, and I think that's important to keep in mind. All right, so we've gone past the pharmaceutical company. Now let's talk a little bit about the Food and Drug Administration. So just a brief history of the FDA. So it was established in 1938. Um, actually, at that time, it was actually mostly to regulate food products because um, our food wasn't very well regulated prior to that. And then in 1951, it was expanded to include prescription drug regulation. Um, in the early 1960s, there was a big scandal with thalidomide, which was a medication given for nausea that caused birth defects, um, and that kind of caused some legislation to be passed in 1962 that said the main concern of the FDA is that medicines are safe and, are, and effective if used as prescribed. So it kind of shifted the regulatory burden to the pharmaceutical companies to make sure that those drugs were safe and effective in order to get approval. Um, what happened after that is that um, the pharmaceutical companies felt like they didn't have um, enough sort of time to recoup on their um, investments in medications, that, that the FDA process was too onerous. Um, and so that led to something called the Hatch-Waxman Act. And I'm actually going to talk about that in a second. So I just want to highlight that the FDA has two main approval processes. There's the new drug approval or application, which relies again on looking at safety and efficacy. And the one thing I want to call your attention to is one thing the FDA does not look at is relative value. So if you come up with a new cholesterol medication in order to get approved, it doesn't matter if you're just as good, worse, better, whatever than a statin, you're still going to get approved for that indication. Um, and then their second process is the abbreviated new drug application, or ANDA. And that basically just said that generic drugs have to show bioequivalence. So it's a, it's a shorter drug process so that the medications are the same, um, have the same effect, that they don't have to go through the whole thing. Sorry. Um, so in 1984, as I said, um, there was a little bit of a push in Congress to kind of, I would say, help the pharmaceutical industry along, and they passed, passed something called the Hatch-Waxman Act. And essentially what that did is it granted a market exclusivity period to pharmaceutical companies, in addition to patents. So a lot of times when you start working on you get a patent, and the patent lasts 10, 20 years. By the time you're done doing the clinical trials, bringing that drug to market, you might only have one or two years left on that patent. And so the drug company said, hey, we need sort of a little bit more protection so that we can recoup on our, um, on our investment and our R&D and actually make some money off these drugs. 
Um, and so the Hatch-Waxman Act was passed. Um, but essentially what it did is, depending on the drug, it grants a period of market exclusivity between five and 12 years. It's essentially a government-granted monopoly. It says, we're not going to approve any generics in this time, so you can make your money. I'll let you guys think about that. Um, so we'll talk about the generic drugs next. So um, generic drug market in general is interesting. It's a major source of savings for us in this country. So he, this is an interesting statistic. Nine out of every 10 prescriptions that are filled in the US um, are generic, and they only account for a quarter of the total spending. Or put another way, one out of 10 pills are brand name, and there's three quarters of our spending on prescription drugs. Um, but interestingly, over the years in the generic industry, competition has decreased a lot. And this has had um, a couple of reasons and a couple of effects. So the reasons for the decrease, one issue is that there's a huge backlog at the FDA. It takes about three years right now to get a generic drug approved. Um, and then we talked a little bit about some of this anti-competitive behavior from pharmaceutical companies. It definitely creates more sort of um, hurdles for these companies. Um, and interestingly, there's just fewer makers of generic drug companies. So basically two to three um, companies make almost all the generics. And so that makes it so that many of these companies can engage in um, what's called price gouging. And so basically when the generic companies feel like they're not making enough money off of a medication, they can just suddenly increase the price. And a really famous example that kind of like brought this practice up in the news um, relates smirking man um, on your screen named Martin Shkreli. Um, he was an investor, uh, basically, and did engage in this, in this price gouging. I think he raised the price almost 5,500% um, of Daraprim, which is used to treat toxo and HIV patients. Um, and there was no reason for it. It didn't get more expensive. It wasn't a new indication. He just hiked up the price. And he ended up in jail, not because price, because that's actually legal, but he ended up in jail because he lied about it to his investors and did all sorts of other dirty stuff. Um, but this actually happening not too infrequently. So um, people may have noticed a huge increase in the price of colchicine, um, albuterol, epinephrine, naloxone. It's happening all the time, um, and the, uh, the generic companies are doing it for a number of reasons, but partially because they can. Um, okay. So now we've sort of talked about the approval process and gone through the FDA pharmaceutical and generics. So I want to move on to pharmacy, to sort of how drugs, once they're there, they're priced, how are they actually distributed, how do they get to patients? So pharmacy benefit managers are a really interesting thing. Um, essentially what they are are they're third-party administrators that negotiate with pharmaceutical companies to set formularies for insurers. So they came about in the 1980s um, when we were seeing a huge increase in the cost of healthcare. And the idea was if you get a bunch of insurers together, then these pharmacy benefit managers can go to the pharmaceutical companies and negotiate a better price for medications. Um, now the industry is uh, controlled by three main pharmacy benefit managers. 80 to 90% of all the industry is controlled by these three folks. So CVS, Caremark, Express Scripts, and Optum United. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how this works out in Ohio. But here in Ohio, CVS, Caremark um, is our pharmacy benefit manager for four out of the five Medicaid plans that we deal with on a regular basis. So, what, so I want to give you guys an example of what they actually do. And these are completely made up numbers. So um, just bear with me. So let's say a pharmaceutical, I don't know if that's going to work, no. Let's say a pharmaceutical manufacturer sets a drug price at $14, okay? So the pharmacy benefit manager approaches that pharmaceutical and says, we want your drug, but look how many people we have in our insurance plan. Um, it's gonna be a huge market for you, so I want you to give us a discount. So they set a discount, let's say they go from 14 to $8. They got a big discount. Then the pharmacy benefit manager turns to both the pharmacy and the insurer and sets a price that the, farm, that the insurer is going to reimburse and also sets a price that they are going to reimburse the pharmacy. And in doing so, they're able to do something called spread pricing, which means that they basically charge the insurer a little more than they need to and give the pharmacy a little less. And you can see that um, 
here, they can still go to the insurer and say, hey, we got you a $4 discount. You went from $14 to $10 for this medication, but for every medication, they're keeping $3 in their pocket. So that's what spread pricing is, and that's what pharmacy, that's how pharmacy benefit managers make their money. Um, and how they do this and what their spread pricing is is completely not transparent. So it's considered proprietary. It's considered a trade secret, and we don't actually know what it is. So you guys may have heard this in the news because it's been in the news a lot in Ohio recently. Um, essentially what happened is that a bunch of pharmacies started sort of like quietly raising a flag to reporters at the Columbus Dispatch. And the Columbus Dispatch did this incredible reporting where they went through tons of stuff, did a bunch of estimates, and realized that CVS Caremark, in particular, um, charged approximately an 8.8% spread and kept $224 million from Medicaid last year. So it's uh, estimated that they gave that Medicaid, because they used this pharmacy benefit manager, got $140 million in discounts from pharmaceutical companies, but they also kept $224 million of our tax dollars. So right now what's happening with that is that the um, Ohio Medicaid um, actually asked for an investigation of this and created a report, wants to make the report public, and CVS Caremark is suing um, to keep that under wraps because they consider it their own proprietary trade secret. Um, so that's going to be an evolving story, but it's happening right here in Ohio. So the pharmacy benefit managers. So let's move on to insurers. So when we talk about insurers, there's basically two types of insurers or partners. We've got our private insurers, which are mostly employee-sponsored plans, um, and that covers 177 million adults in the U.S. And then you have your public insurers, and those are government-sponsored plans. That's Medicare, Medicaid, and then the VA and Department of Defense and those guys who kind of get grouped together in my mind. Um, and in general, the general strategy for insurers is that most of them use pharmacy benefit managers to set their formularies and get their discounts from pharmaceutical companies. And then they try to defray their own costs by um, kind of passing on costs to the consumer. So if drug prices go up, if cost of healthcare goes up, they'll raise premiums, they raise co-pays, they raise co-insurances, because they're also, in the end of the day, a business. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, we're going to go through the policy that shapes public insurers and drug costs. I think this is really interesting. So I'll start with Medicare. So you guys will recall that Medicare is our um, insurance for 65, people 65 and older, um, also people who have end-stage renal disease, ALS, or specific disabilities. Um, and the prescription drug benefit for Medicare is called Part D. It's an optional benefit. It was passed in 2003, enacted in 2006 with the Medicare Moderniz Moder Modernization Act of 2003. Um, and essentially what they decided is they were gonna do Medicare prescription drugs much like private insurers do Medicare prescription drugs. So they said, we're gonna administer these benefits through standalone private drug plans. So when enrollees go to enroll in Medicaid, or sorry, Medicare, you go online, there's a plan compare, you can put in your medications. I just did this for my mom. And um, you can basically pick a private plan in your area that you think works best for you. Um, a couple of things to note about Medicare Part D. One is that federal law actually prohibits the HHS secretary from, for negotiating for Medicare as a whole. So each standalone plan can have a pharmacy benefit manager that they use to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies, but Medicare as a whole cannot use their sort of collective bargaining power to get better prices. And I think I, you might remember that Medicare actually gets pretty crappy prices for their drugs. Um, they pay a lot. They pay what private insurers pay. Um, and the other thing to know, and just this is just more for you guys to know when you hear your patients talk about this, is that there's this thing called the donut hole in Medicare Part D. Have people experienced that in the office? Maybe. Those of us who do more primary care, maybe. Um, but so essentially what that means is that enrollees in Medicare pay a certain deductible, and then they have a certain amount of money that they get to pay for prescription drugs. Right now that's $405 and then goes to uh, $3,700. At that time, they pay 25% of their prescription, and the plan pays 75%. When they're out of that, they fall into this so-called donut hole, which is sort of like a gap where your coverage is less good. Um, that's between 3,700 and about 8,400. 
um, dollars total spent on prescription drug costs that year. Um, and then they have to pay a higher percentage, basically. And so this happens to me not infrequently in clinic where someone will say, hey, I'm in my donut hole. I need a different drug or we need to figure something out because I can't afford this. Um, and then past 8,400, then it, again, it gets paid a lot more. Um, so you, you might hear that. Um, so again, Medicare, when we're looking at the little diagram, works a lot like a private insurer. They use pharmacy benefit managers. They use private drug plans chosen during enrollment. Um, and there's this donut hole that resets every year that you may hear about. Um, okay, moving on to Medicaid. So Medicaid is our joint federal and state program for the poor. Um, a pre-Affordable Care Act, it used to be for the poor and disabled. It still is in a lot of states, but in the states like Ohio that expanded Medicaid, now it's for the poor. And basically, you can make um, up to 133% of the poverty line in order to qualify for Medicaid. In Ohio, that's about 16000 for a family of two, so something to keep in mind. Um, but essentially how it works in Medicaid is that in 1999, there was a drug pass um, that started the Medicaid drug rebate program. And basically, that was a program to help curb costs. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Um, and basically what that says is that uh, pharmaceutical companies give a mandatory rebate or discount to Medicaid plans, and that's 23% on brand names and 13% on generic drugs. Um, and that's paid back to the states quarterly uh, and shared with the federal government. So um, Medicaid can choose to use a ph pharmacy benefit manager if they want. Here, um, we, we do manage Medicaid in Ohio. Other states have just uh, government-run uh, Medicaid. Um, but you can choose to use the pharmacy benefit managers, but no matter what, you're going to get this 23% um, brand rebate, brand rebate and a 13% generic rebate. Um, and then this is, I think, really important. So in addition to the Medicaid um, drug rebate program, there's also something called a 340B program, and we have that here at Metro. Um, so the 340B program was cleverly named because it's the Section 340B of the Public Health Service Act of 1992. Um, and essentially what that did was, again, acknowledging that drug prices were getting out of control, it was an attempt to sort of stretch scarce federal resources as far as possible, serving eligible patients. So what does that mean? So basically what that means is any drug company that participates in the Medicaid drug rebate program, which is pretty much all pharmaceutical companies, um, they have to provide additional discounts to pharmacies associated with 340B entities. So 340B entities are government plans, uh, government or semi-government funded um, uh, healthcare providers that serve vulnerable populations. So that can be dish hospitals or disproportionate share hospitals. That can be federally qualified health centers, metro counts. Um, and so basically you get pharmacy, the pharmacy, um, sorry, the pharmaceutical companies giving uh, the 340B entity a huge discount. And then the 340B entity goes ahead and um, can dispense medication to Medicaid patients, uninsured patients, privately insured patients, or Medicare patients. And when they dispense it to Medica Medicare or privately insured, they get the full cost of the drug even though they only paid a discounted price, and they get to keep the extra money. So it's kind of like spread pricing again. They get to keep the extra money as a source of revenue, with the idea being that these are places that serve a lot of vulnerable patients and are going to invest that money back into those services and into those communities. So again, just to reiterate, you have a very discounted rate that goes from the pharmaceutical company to the 340B entity, which can be a dish hospital, an FQHC, and then um, they get given at a discount to uninsured patients, to Medicaid patients, and then with Medicare and private insurers, they pay the full reimbursement, and they get to keep the extra money, which is supposed to be reinvested. Um, and then this is our last public payer. Um, so the VA uh, pays for prescription drugs differently than all the other public payers, so, and it is able to achieve a huge prescription drug cost. So in 1992, that same Veterans Health Care Act set a mandatory 24% rebate. Um, again, drug companies have to give a, a discount to the VA. And then in addition to that, they were granted the ability to negotiate with, form, with um, drug companies to set their formularies. 
and they were given the ability to set one national formulary. So all of a sudden they have a ton more purchasing power and it's easier for physicians to prescribe from the formulary because you just put it into the EMR and it pops right up. So the result is that the VA pays about half um, of the amount paid for uh, drug prices that private payers or Medicare does. So again, they get a big discount from the pharmaceutical companies and they're able to negotiate with their big formulary. They're their own pharmacy benefit manager, own pharmacy, own prescriber, own insurer, and they get a lot of savings. But isn't that an easier diagram? Um, okay, so just to recap, so you guys made it through the whole thing. So to recap, we've got the FDA. Um, again, they, they mainly say that a drug, drug is safe and effective. They don't talk about comparative value. They grant exclusivity beyond the patent, so that they grant this time where drug company can make a profit or recoup their R&D, depending on what you think of that. And then there are, is this issue of long waits for generic approval, about three years. And the Hatch-Waxman Act was the piece of policy that granted that ex exclusivity and also set the rules for generic um, approval. Pharmaceutical companies, I think, Hopefully, it's sort of complicated it for you guys today. It's really important for driving innovation. It's an important part of our economy, but they're also accountable to their shareholders rather than the public, and so they maybe have different priorities than what we would like them to. They set prices at what the market will bear. They're very politically powerful, and they have uh, they can engage in anti-competitive practices. Pharmacy benefit managers are third-party entities that negotiate between the pharmaceutical companies and the insurers in order to get a better price. Um, for the insurers, but the downside is their practices are opaque, so we don't know what kind of discount we're getting, um, and they also make their money via spread pricing through what they basically keep. And then insurers, I think the really interesting takeaway here is that different payers have different legal abilities to negotiate for drug pricing, and so they pass on um, the price fluctuations to the consumer via co-pays, via formulary changes, via tier setting. Um, and there's a lot of policy that shapes that, and this is just a overview. In 2006, remember Medicare Part D was established as the optional drug benefit for Medicare. Medicaid has an average um, discount of 23%. We have the 340B program that gets a discount and then gets to keep the difference. And then the VA kind of does all their own thing, gets to negotiate prices, and gets good savings. So what's the road ahead? So um, pharmaceutical uh, companies, drug pricing, all this stuff is in the news all the time. So I just picked up a couple of things, but um, President Trump had a, a blueprint to lower prices earlier this year. Last year in Ohio, we were embroiled in issue two. We heard a lot about no and a lot about yes the, for the Ohio Drug Price Relief Act. Um, and there's kind of things going on in every state um, and on the federal level that uh, could move this issue forward. So just a broad overview of the types of legislation that's being um, talked about right now. On the state level, a lot of legislation surrounds transparency, both with pharmacy benefit managers and with pharmaceutical companies. So basically just asking them or compelling them to share with us a little bit more about why and how they price um, so that we have a better understanding as consumers. Um, Maryland passed an anti-price gouging bill that basically said to generic companies, hey, you guys can't hike up prices like this. This is crazy. Um, it's actually being, it's embroiled in court right now. So I don't know if it's going to pass or not. It did pass, but um, it's, they're suing, pharma's suing. Um, and then let's see. So both in Ohio and in California, there were bills to try to tie uh, state prices to VA prices. And I'm happy to take questions about that. They both failed. Again, a lot of pharmaceutical lobby against that too. Um, so federal efforts, a lot of uh, President Trump's blueprint, uh, what was around sort of curbing monopoly abuses, so trying to kind of um, make some of these things, regulate some of these things a little bit more like the product hopping, the pay for delay, the, just general obstructionism. Um, and then there's a lot of talk of Medicare reform. So I can go into Part B more if people are curious, but Part D, um, there is a, a House uh, bill right now um, that's called the Medicare Negotiation and Competitive Licensing, Licensing Act that would allow Medicare to negotiate the way the VA does. Um, doesn't tie the prices, but it just allows them to negotiate. Um, and a lot of Ohio Congress people are actually signed on to that, so if you're curious, you could take a look. Um, there's some ideas of drug cost review commissions like they have in other countries. And then finally, there's some more sort of federal price gouging legislation, and um, Senator Sherrod Brown, who's an Ohio senator, is the one who introduced that. So what can you do about this? 
And how am I on time? Oh, I'm good. Okay. Um, so what you can do with your patients is ask them if they have concerns about prescription drug costs. And that's actually a, a Medicare quality measure um, that is looked at in our care. But I think it's actually just important because if 44% of people are worried about it, then if we're not asking and we're just not hearing about it because it's happening. Um, so ask people. And then one thing that I found really useful is learning to look at formulary. So check out what insurance they have and then Google care source preferred drug list or United Healthcare preferred drug list. And you can see exactly what they cover in which tier and kind of save yourself a bunch of back and forth with the pharmacy when they get there and it's $200. Um, and then the last thing is use Metro pharmacies as much as possible. Really encourage your patients to use the 340B pharmacy, partially because it gets the best prices for patients, but also because it's a source of revenue for our hospital and it's a really important source of revenue. Um, and what can you do about it with your lawmakers, right? There's these really powerful political lobbies. Well, the main thing is to vote if you're able. Um, otherwise, get in touch with state and federal representatives about this, these issues, share your stories, um, share patient stories, be a voice for your patients. And that's actually super easy to do if you just Google who is my house rep, who is my senator, it comes right up, it takes five minutes to send an email. I do it pretty much every week. Um, and I think it's important. I think it helps. Um, and I just want to um, acknowledge a few people. So I got interested in this topic through the National Physicians Alliance, which is a um, sort of nonpartisan uh, physician advocacy organization that does a physician advocacy fellowship. And that's how I started learning about this. So thank you to Becky, Greg, and Justin, um, who helped me a lot with this talk. And then thank you to all the wonderful people at Metro Health, including Dr. King, Dr. Wax, Dr. Margolius, and Dr. Yamahiro, who are so supportive and wonderful. And my husband for listening to this uh, for a long time. And those are my references that I'm happy to share. Um, and I'd love to take questions or get thoughts. Because um, I actually am a pharmacist. If you are using 340B, um, if a patient has insurance, unless the pharmacist knows that you want to have the prescription run through 340B, it makes sense to put 340B in the SIG. Um, because sometimes I have patients who come back to me and they say, well, you know, I thought I was going to get Levamir for this cheap price. And in fact, they didn't because the pharmacist, if they see insurance, they're just going to automatically assume uh, the uh, insurance is going to take care of it. A um, couple other things with regards to the gag rule. Um, right now, um, hopefully, pharmacists are not being penalized for patients to ask which is cheaper to pay cash or run it through insurance. So I always tell patients, please ask your pharmacist. When you're getting that prescription filled, does it make more sense for me to pay cash or does it make sense for me to run it through my insurance? Because the PBMs are, in fact, really upcharging on generics that you would think are pretty inexpensive. Um, just one more thought, if bear with me. I also sit on Medicaid P&T for the state of Ohio, and happy day for all of us because our legislators finally agreed or sort of forced Ohio Medicaid's hands. We will have a single um, formulary for all of managed care and fee-for-service Ohio Medicaid starting on January 1st of 2019. They're phasing it in because I think the PBMs, of course, have a lot to say about this. Um, so uh, we can't do the whole formulary all at once, but if you go to the Ohio Medicaid fee-for-service formulary, there's a good chance what you see there is what's going to become eventually the formulary for all Medicaid plans in the state of Ohio. So I did sort of urge our Ohio Medicaid buddies, I said, let's not ding around with stuff that nobody prescribes, like let's please do the things that we prescribe a lot, like diabetes and hypertension and asthma and medically assisted opioid dependency and things like that. So they did listen to us and um, so hopefully we'll be moving to one formulary soon and that'll be so much easier for I'm sure everybody in this room. 
Yeah, that's amazing information. Thank you. And yeah, I didn't I didn't specifically mention the gag um, rules, but that's something that was passed in Ohio. Um, Basically, what the gag rule was is that the pharmacy benefit manager contracted with pharmacies and said, you actually can't tell people if something is cheaper, uh, if they pay out of pocket, unless they ask. And many patients, most patients don't ask. And it's a great reminder to, to have your patients remember to ask if it's cheaper if they pay cash. Are there questions up here? Uh, I guess my hope is that with all the PBM stuff in the news, that they're going to kind of lose traction um, and there's going to be less, I don't know if that's maybe a little too optimistic, but I mean, I, I do think that the consolidation, how few players they are, there are in the PBM market is definitely a problem because they don't have that much competition, right? They don't, and they have, they have no uh, duty to be transparent. So my hope is that some of these transparency laws are going to pass and, um, I actually think Ohio is a really, it's incredible, it's a, a sort of a flagship state, um, and this, this legal battle with Medicaid and CVS is going to be really interesting to watch it pan out. Um, I don't know the exact answer, but my hope is that they'll have less power over time as things become more transparent. It's the optimist in me. Uh, first off, thank you for uh, shining some light into this very you know, murky situation. Um, Something that I'm, I'm very interested in, sort of what drives the cost of drugs up, including generic drugs, because you would think, you know, something that's been out for 50 years should be cheap by now. Um, so when I've looked into sort of what the bottleneck is, why does it take three years to get approved? I realized that the bottleneck really is in the FDA. And because the FDA is funded by Congress and Congress is so heavily lobbied by the pharmaceutical industry, I'm very pessimistic that this problem is going to be fixed at the federal level. Um, I think with issue two, there was clearly, a, a, it shows there was a very strong interest in trying to solve this at the state level. Uh, I think issue two was not designed properly to kind of address the underlying bottleneck. My question is, do you think we could come up with some kind of, you know, um, group to advocate a new proposition for, you know, the 2020 ballot or something for a, a better design, um, you know, approach to this? Yeah, I love that idea. I, I agree. I think um, issue two, the more I learned about it, the more I felt sort of misled because I personally, even as a doctor who cares about this topic, really didn't know what to think. Um, and I think part of that is because it was done by an outsider. So it was this California guy who came in um, and kind of like told us what to do here in Ohio. And I just don't think Ohioans liked that. Um, and so I think there are, I actually think it's a smart thing that it was, it was, uh, advocating and there's ways to maybe even be smarter about it and to protect from some of the things people were fearful of and, and do something new in 2020 or 2022. So yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Completely agree. And I, I was just going to mention about the generics. So part of the Trump blueprint, uh, President Trump's blueprint was, um, was to try to increase staffing at the FDA to get through generics. I don't think that that's happened yet, but that's one of his ideas in case. Yeah, Catherine. Oh. I'm wondering, with the recent, you know, for, for me, a discharge from the hospital, one of the more recent changes to care for in particular is getting insulin, you know, the Udalala no longer, and whatever the name that new one is. <laughs> is that care for it, or is that actually the PBM that's, where that's coming from? Um. I don't know. So her question, um, Dr. Curley's question was around um, the change in insulin recently and the care source formulary from Humalog to Adamalog. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this. My impression um, is that so care source uses CVS Caremark to negotiate, and my sense is that that probably originated with the PBM and then got sort of told to or negotiated with care source. I don't know if you have any insight into that. I would like to concur with you. I mean, and, and these contracts change routinely. Uh, they change on a dime. And hence, this is why I think our Ohio legislator said, all right, enough is enough. We have all these PDMs, plus you have a fee for service population, albeit that is the smallest. And so they, they just said, all right, 
we will only have one formulary. All the PBMs within the state will have to live and abide by one formulary, and it is established by the P and G committee. So um, you know, we'll see what happens. But again, it's going to be somewhat slow. And there's probably at least 50 or 60 categories of drugs. Yeah. So, but they can change on a dime, and they do. And it's all about the rebating and how much money they're getting back and things like that. And I think one thing that's really important to note is that it's, none of that is transparent. We have no idea what you know what the PBMs are talking to who and to why. And to, so I think that is a source of frustration for those of us prescribing. So two observations from an old timer. First, a historical note. There used to be a single formulary in Ohio, and actually John Corlett, who after he left running the Department of Medicaid, became the head of government affairs for Metro, put that in. And as soon as government, Governor Kasich came in, uh, that disappeared. And so I enjoyed back in the old days, in fact, a single formulary. So it has existed. It's gone. It's back now. That's the problem with American politics. I want to go back to what you said at the beginning about European and other civilized wealthy countries thinking about this as a drugs as a utility rather than as a profit-seeking sector. Do you see any chance that that could ever happen here? Um, how much did I say pharma lobbies last year? You know, I mean, there are some ideas. So one of the federal ideas that's been floated is a drug review commission committee. Um, and so I guess the answer to your question is probably no. I don't think that right now in this country we're heading towards more federal regulation. But I do think that the highest chance of that is to try to consolidate formularies that exist um, because they're kind of the most likely to be able to streamline and make those because formularies are making a value assumption, essentially. They're saying, we're going to do this one and not this one, cover this one and not this one. So I think probably the most hope of that is through statewide initiatives and that kind of thing, because I'm not sure on the federal level that that's where this is heading. I think it would be great if it would, but yeah. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take more questions after. Thanks for all your amazing tech work. Thank you.